The NES might not be the first game console you think of when it comes to spine-tingling horror video games, but the deeper you dig, you'll find all sorts of ghoulish delights, ranging from silly spooky stuff to the downright disturbing. In this video, we'll be taking a comprehensive tour of the haunted side of the library of the NES and Famicom, uncovering all the ghosts, demons, skeletons, zombies, and disembodied samurai heads we can find. We'll keep the scope fairly wide and delve into a few adjacent subgenres as well. So grab a bucket of candy, sharpen your machete, and let's get this monster party started. In what might be the ultimate love letter to horror on the NES, Monster Party is the age-old story of a young child with a baseball bat being abducted by a flying bird dude and coerced into helping him free his world from evil monsters, all with the help of performance-enhancing drugs. It's a very coherent action platformer under the hood, with a bit of exploration within each of its eight stages, but the main draw here is the sheer quantity of wild and absurd enemies and bosses to fight with ranging from legs popping out of the ground, reverse mermen, very polite but dead bloated lizards, poltergeist pants, and the true silent killer, fried food. The game never takes itself too seriously. In fact, the unreleased Japanese prototype was even called Parody World with that version including a handful of direct spoof boss fights, like a gremlin in a box, a xenomorph from Alien, and this Planet of the Apes set piece. This lighthearted goofiness might be the only explanation for how Bandai got away with such copious amounts of blood and gore in an era when Nintendo games were often heavily censored. In the end, this is one literally face-melting party that you don't want to miss. Continuing with the spooky spoofs, we have Splatterhouse Juan Paku Graffiti, a super deformed follow-up to Namco's arcade classic, although it's not quite a direct sequel. Aside from the light-hearted tone shift, the gameplay also features more of an emphasis on platforming action as you guide the cute little axe-wielding protagonist Rick on his mission to rescue his girlfriend Jennifer from the Pumpkin King. Not unlike Monster Party, you get a very solid side-scroller that's a pleasure to play as you hack your way through various levels and boss fights chock full of often hilarious horror movie references. There's even some basic character progression with increased health capacity from killing more enemies and multiple endings. While Monster Party may have snuck by the Nintendo of America censorship squad, this one probably had no chance without some heavy modifications, and that's the only reason I can think of as to why this never came to the West. Next up, we got a look at the hockey mask sporting fiend that inspired the Splatterhouse series in the first place. Based on the hugely successful slasher movie franchise, Friday the 13th is a rather ambitious attempt to bring the iconic Jason Voorhees onto the NES, as you control a team of six counselors trying to survive a weekend at Camp Crystal Lake, searching for any weapons or clues that might help you fend off Jason's relentless rampage and protect the other campers. While this one has often been negatively received, I find that it had some great ideas in the early times of the survival horror genre, and an undeniably terrifying vibe. When I played this as a kid, I definitely remember getting jump scared left and right, and seriously creeped out by the eerie atmosphere and generally cryptic nature of the gameplay. The game certainly has its flaws, but it's a must play for horror fans if you can persevere through its unique quirks and difficulty curve. Here we have another LJN take on a horror icon, this time facing off with the dreamy Freddy Krueger in A Nightmare on Elm Street, a more conventional side-scrolling beat-em-up platformer developed by Rare, seeing you collect Freddy's bones in efforts to burn them to dust in the local high school furnace. A 
It does have a cool sleep meter mechanic where you may find yourself drifting off into a more challenging dream world, but this is also a world where you can imagine yourself as an amazing athlete, ninja, or wizard. You can even bring along some friends for the journey, as the game supports up to four players at once, provided you have an adapter to do so. Either way, it's a really solid and fun challenge, with a memorable soundtrack by David Wise, and probably one of LJN's best games on the console. We'll keep that LJN flowing, and check out this appearance by the ghost with the most, Beetlejuice, based on Tim Burton's fantasy horror comedy classic from 1988. You control Beetlejuice himself through this surreal and wacky adventure where you stomp on bugs. Okay, weird, but a necessary step in getting enough currency to buy scare power-ups from that shrunken head guy, often required to progress past certain enemies and bosses. This is probably one of those cases where the developers may have had a checklist of cool stuff they wanted to include from the film, and then they just blended it all together into a really weird tasting janky milkshake. That being said, the game's wacky charm has really grown on me over the years, and it actually ends up being pretty satisfying to figure out the nuances of its rather unhinged game design. Cool School becomes Ghoul School in this weird and wild Metroidvania developed by Imagineering. You play as the Mohawk Sporting Spike, traversing the maze-like hallways of your monster-infested high school to rescue head cheerleader Samantha Pom Pom, tracking down an odd assortment of weapons and items required to open up new areas of the game's mostly open world. This might be another good example of a lot of creativity and ambition that ultimately falls victim to limitations on technology and time constraints on development, as it seems full of some really neat and fun ideas, but may be highly debatable as to whether or not it gets a passing grade. Time to point and click our way to terror with the Maniac Mansion, a port of the groundbreaking horror comedy graphic adventure game, originally released in 1987 by Lucasfilm Games on home computers. While a stripped down port was made for the Famicom in 1988, it was further reworked and released in 1990 for the NES with a version a bit more faithful to the original but still getting censored a bit to conform to Nintendo's content guidelines. You've got a squad of different teenage characters to control with their own unique traits, solving puzzles with a variety of available actions provided by the now iconic Scum user interface, which actually translated over to home consoles quite well and introduced this campy classic to an all new audience. Don't put your cursor away quite yet as we delve into Castle Shadowgate, the overhauled NES port of the Mac Venture point and click classic from 1987. In your quest to rid the world of the Warlock Lord, you will probably die a lot. Shadowgate's cryptic logic and constant need to save your game might fend off the impatient but sticking with this one provides a very memorable adventure, drenched in gothic atmosphere, and featuring some truly disturbing descriptions of your demise. And it's another shining example of how graphic adventure games can still find great success without having a keyboard and mouse plugged in. Kemco would continue to port Mac Ventures to the NES with this haunted house horror gem uninvited. Using the same interface as their previous games, in this adventure you wake up in your wrecked car in front of a spooky mansion, determined to find your missing sister. 
Similar to Shadowgate, you'll be exploring your environment, collecting lots of weird and often useless items in your inventory, and all the while dying in wild and brutal ways. While this game may not have had the same impact as Shadowgate at the time, it's still a must-play for point-and-click horror enthusiasts. One last point-and-click I should mention is the Chinese bootleg port of Darkseed, which was a 1992 horror adventure game notable for its artwork by H.R. Giger. There isn't a complete translation patch available yet that I'm aware of, and I honestly haven't tried the original, so I haven't spent much time with this one. But it's just weird that it exists at all, and it looks surprisingly ambitious for an unofficial remake released nine years after its predecessor. Speaking of translation patches, I'm definitely glad this game got one. The Japanese exclusive horror classic Sweet Home is an RPG from Capcom that eventually served as the main inspiration for Resident Evil and was hugely influential in forming the foundation of the survival horror genre. Not unlike Maniac Mansion, you control a team of characters with unique abilities, trying to unravel the mysteries of the house and fend off all sorts of creepy creatures. But in this case, the tone is more serious and genuinely scary at times. On top of the turn-based combat, the game also emphasizes inventory management and puzzle solving and the dreaded permanent deaths of your characters, which will affect the ending you get if you can survive this blood-curdling experience. Often considered one of the greatest horror games of all time, you'll definitely want to take a little tour of Sweet Home. Resident Evil also illegitimately found itself on the Famicom with a somewhat ambitious port of Biohazard, which follows the story and setting of the PS1 classic surprisingly accurately, but with a top-down adventure game feel. You play as Jill Valentine, wandering around the mansion, searching for items and fending off zombies, and notably the combat plays out with an interesting meter timing mechanic, not unlike a golf game. It's an impressive attempt in some regards, but also generally feels very broken and cheaply assembled. It's still definitely of interest for fans of the series or bootleg games in general. Here we have another ambitious title in the early days of survival horror with Dr. Chaos. You play as a guy searching for his quantum physicist brother, who has been experimenting with portals to other dimensions in his giant creepy mansion in this metroidvania platformer cross-pollinated with first-person point-and-click exploration, much like the combo found in Konami's Goonies 2. As you collect munitions and uncover secret portals to monster-infested warp zones, you'll eventually piece together a giant laser gun required to defeat the final boss. Everything is definitely feeling a bit jank here, but it's generally an interesting and rewarding experience in the end, and fans of the 1986 horror film House may recognize a few of the enemies lurking about. Now, if we really want to get into some jank, here's one of the most infamous examples. Based on the classic story by Robert Louis Stevenson, you control Dr. Jekyll on his way to his wedding with an array of pesty people with high-powered explosives, random animals pooping on you, and various obstacles increasingly causing the buildup of an anger meter. If you get too stressed out, it's Mr. Hyde time, as you trip out and start blasting away your inner demons with your powerful Psycho Wave. The concept is neat, but this is generally a bewildering hot mess, which might be fun if you're into that sort of thing.
And here we have a much more competently put together take on another literary classic with Bandai's Frankenstein, The Monster Returns. Although in this case, Frankenstein's monster has risen from the dead, assembled a supernatural army, and worst of all, kidnapped the village babe, Emily. It's up to you to rescue and defeat the monster and his minions in this very solid action platformer, almost on par with the Castlevania series. Cool cutscenes and a wide variety of monsters to battle make this one an easy suggestion for a great spooky side-scrolling challenge that you might not have tried before. Digging into another literary classic, Francis Ford Coppola's well-received film adaptation of Bram Stoker's Dracula also managed to produce a crap ton of merchandising ranging from trading cards to pinball machines, and of course video games on eight different platforms. The 8-bit versions on the Game Boy, Game Gear, Master System, and NES are all fairly similar to one another as you play as Jonathan Harker and face off with the Big Drac himself. It's a pretty straightforward and fast-paced platformer without any strong connections to the film's plot, unless those big question mark blocks were in the director's cut or something. And it's worth mentioning the three different difficulty modes actually determine how much of the game you get to play. So if you want to see all seven stages, you might as well bite the bullet and go straight to hard mode. And I guess if we're talking about Dracula now, it's about time for the big one many of you are probably waiting for. That's right, it's Drax Night Out. This unreleased treasure was a Reebok-sponsored endeavor featuring Dracula himself sporting a luxurious pair of Reebok pumps, the edge you need to safely navigate through your own castle, swarming with hostile villagers, and eventually search the village for your lovely Mina before the sun comes up. Despite this wallowing in obscurity as an unreleased prototype, it's very much playable from start to finish, and it's a rare opportunity to play as the Big D himself. Alright, so here's the real granddaddy of 8-bit horror, the original Castlevania, developed and published by Konami for the Famicom Disk System in 1986 and brought to the NES in North America in 1987, the birth of a long-running and now iconic series with a slew of much-revered games and spin-offs. The first installment might feel a little bit dated and straightforward compared to its later brethren, but this is an undeniable classic and a huge influence on the action platformer genre at large. Packed full of classic horror movie monsters and dripping with gothic vibes, you control Simon Belmont, jumping and whipping your way through Dracula's castle and munching on whatever weird wall meat you can scrounge up along the journey. Castlevania II Simon's Quest veers off the beaten path by dropping Simon into an open world, introducing RPG elements like gaining experience points and buying items from merchants, a day-night cycle, and the always crowd-pleasing fake floors. Your mileage may vary as to whether you enjoy the ambitious changes or not, especially considering all of the cryptic puzzles lost in translation and aimless exploration you might encounter if you don't want to use a walkthrough or helpful ROM hack. Simon's Quest still certainly retains its spooky vibes and banging soundtrack though, and remains an important landmark in the franchise's history. And now for my personal favorite of the NES trilogy, let's take a look at Dracula's Curse. Now we sit a bit more comfortably in the vein of straightforward action of the first game, but still retaining some non-linear elements of Simon's Quest, as branching paths allow for some choice in your level selection as you whip your way to Drac once more. This time around, you play as Simon's ancestor Trevor Belmont, 
and also can recruit help along the way from Grant Dynasty, Saifa Belnades, and Dracula's son, Alucard. They all have their own unique skills and introduce a lot of great gameplay variety in what also might be the most challenging game of the three. Konami continued to improve the graphics and music as well, further solidifying the macabre ambiance and staking its claim as the pinnacle of horror adventure on the NES. Finally, to wrap up our look at Castlevania's legacy, we have Kid Dracula, a spin-off parody game released by Konami themselves in 1990, exclusively in Japan at the time. Wildly different in tone, you play as Dracula's 10,000 years young son in a more cute and cartoony action platforming quest to retake your throne from the demon Gallimoth. Despite the silliness, we still have an extremely fun and well-made game here, and it mixes up the Castlevania formula a bit with Kid Drac's evolving special abilities and even some mini-games in between the levels. The impact of Castlevania certainly had an influence on other game makers of the time, and at first glance, Eight Eyes may look like a blatant carbon copy. It does have some interesting differences to set it apart though, most notably your Falcon Companion, which you have some limited control over in one player mode, or you could also have a friend control it cooperatively with a second controller. The game's stages can also be played in any order, with the bosses vulnerable to different obtainable weapons not unlike a Mega Man title. It's certainly not as polished as its inspiration, but still a solid curiosity worth exploring. Here's another Castlevania-like that I hadn't actually heard of until I began doing research for this video. Mato no Hokai, The Hero of Babel, was released in 1988 for the Famicom Disk System, with heavy inspirations from Simon's Quest. The Tower of Babel you're climbing through is strongly reminiscent of the mansions, items can be found in torches, you're throwing holy water all over the place, you need to grind for experience points, weird guys in robes offer you hints, and I think you see what's happening here. Now, I haven't played this one much yet, but it sort of feels like a we have Simon's quest at home kind of situation. Perhaps a more well-known and infamous take on the Castlevania style is the heavy metal flavored Holy Diver. Released in Japan by Irem in 1989, and also saw a recent reissue for the NES by Retrobit in 2018. Unofficially based on Dio's album of the same name, you play as Ronnie in the year 666 and must save the Crimson Kingdom from the hands of the Black Slayer. Beneath all the metal references, you have a brutal action platformer here full of monsters and magic. Arguably the true terror may be the sprite flickering and eaten inputs, but it's still a satisfying challenge for anyone resilient enough for its intense difficulty curve. Now it's time to bark at the moon and check out Werewolf, the Last Warrior. Released by Data East in 1990, you play as a Native American warrior named Chief Warwolf, who has also harnessed the ability of turning into a werewolf, a story detailed in the game's included comic book. Despite werewolves being a classic horror staple, this game has a bit more of a comic book vibe to it, especially considering some of the bosses you run into. But overall, you have a really solid and challenging action game here, and one of Data East's strongest outings on the NES. Sega's arcade classic Altered Beast saw several ports to a range of different home consoles and computer platforms, including this often forgotten Famicom version. 
The giant sprites may be shrunken down, but Azmik did manage to add a few new levels and new beast types to transform into, including a lion, shark, and phoenix. It's still a bit rough around the edges, but fans of the original might be morbidly curious enough to explore this one. Monster in My Pocket may be best known as those little tiny rubbery toy figures similar to Muscle Men, but you know, they're monsters instead. They also made trading cards, a board game, comic books, and this pretty great NES title, published by Konami in 1992, which even included a figure with the game. You can choose between the vampire or the monster in a fun and well-assembled action platformer with the quality you'd expect from Konami this late in the NES's life cycle. There isn't anything super innovative here, but you do get simultaneous two-player co-op and some creative level concepts leaning into the notion that our monstrous heroes can still fit into your pants pocket. And if we're talking about little monsters, it seems like the perfect time to bring up Gremlins 2, a top-down action platformer from Sunsoft based on the Joe Dante film of the same name. You control Gizmo as he traverses the gremlin-infested Clamp Center building, and the game manages to include many locations, plot points, characters, and those wacky gremlin hybrids from the movie. More importantly, the game itself is really fun, feeling almost like an evolved version of the top-down sections of Blaster Master, but with some tricky jumping thrown in the mix. It's a must-play for fans of the movies, and easily the best incarnation of the gremlins in video game form. Let's go backwards a year in the world of Sunsoft top-down action and check out the notorious Fester's Quest, very loosely based on characters from the 1960s classic TV series The Addams Family. This game was actually made two years before The Addams Family movie in 1991, so it's kind of wild that this bizarre take on an old spooky sitcom even exists at all. You play as good old Uncle Fester on a mission to save your city from aliens using what could probably be one of the most frustrating guns in NES history. There's a lot of exploration, item collection, and even a bit of first-person dungeon crawling. And in the end, we've got a real oddball here, where the game has that hint of sunsoft polish, yet also some rather bewildering design choices. And the Addams Family would come back to the NES in 1992, this time with Ocean cashing in on the movie license and putting out a slew of games of questionable quality for a variety of systems. In this iteration, you play as Gomez on a quest to save Morticia, who is locked away in the mansion's vault, and in a Metroidvania-like fashion, you'll have to track down various family members throughout the property to unlock access to new areas and collecting as much cash as possible along the way. The Addams Family media juggernaut would continue with a cartoon series and, of course, more video games. Pugsley's Scavenger Hunt would see three different versions on the Game Boy, Super Nintendo, and NES in another romp of searching the family abode for a bunch of random stuff. This particular one feels a lot more like a remake of the 16-bit iterations, but feels weirdly empty with a general lack of music, background artwork, and Pugsley's soul-sucking blank stare. Uh, now Ghostbusters was one of my favorite movies as a kid, but playing the NES version was truly terrifying for the wrong reasons. Originally a computer game rushed through production in six weeks, not long after the film's release in 1984. It was gradually ported to several consoles, including the Famicom in 1986 and the NES in 1988. 
While driving around the city, capturing ghosts seems like an easy formula for a fun video game. This version is rather miserable, with a long money grind leading up to a grueling stairway climb to the rooftop battle with Zool. This port feels extremely rough and dated for the hardware that it's on, and you're probably just better off with the original on Commodore, or maybe try out the Master System version. Now this might not be saying much, but Imagineering's follow-up is leaps and bounds better, with a more coherent outing, mixing some run and goop action, arcade-like driving sections, and even a hint of shoot 'em up while you control the Statue of Liberty. Now this game is no masterpiece by any means, but something about that charming Imagineering flavor makes me a stay puffed softy for this one, and it provides a tough but fair challenge in the end. Now outside of the US, there was actually a different Ghostbusters 2 game developed by HAL Laboratory that never came stateside due to some licensing issues. And it's easily the best bust-in you'll get on the system, as you and an AI-controlled teammate zap and trap ghosts in various locations from the movie. While there isn't much to do beyond that, the mechanic is really well done and makes for a very fun top-down action experience. Speaking of ghosts, it's about time we dig into the prolific Makai Mura series with the original Ghosts and Goblins. Capcom's arcade hit from 1985 would go on to be ported all over the place, with Micronix in charge of programming the NES version. A developer name that is probably more terrifying than all the ghouls and demons you'll encounter in this brutal side-scrolling classic. You control Sir Arthur in a quest to rescue Princess Prinprin from the King of the Demon World, Astaroth, arming yourself with a variety of weapons through six challenging stages, which you'll also need to play through twice if you want to see the game's true ending. The intense challenge is further compounded by Micronic's jank, but it's still an important stamp to slap onto your pro gamer resume. It truly can be a lot of fun if you're ready for some pain. In the same series, we also have the prequel to a Game Boy spin-off with Gargoyles Quest 2. If you're not confused already, don't worry, because this game is fantastic and absolutely worth checking out. Similar to its handheld predecessor, it mixes up some top-down exploration gameplay with action platforming, where you play as the Red Armor himself, Firebrand. The movement gets rather more technical than a typical platformer, as he can glide horizontally, cling to walls, and even create his own platforms. This one was a bit late in the NES lifespan, so it was often overlooked at the time, but definitely worth investigating, as I find it's one of the finest Capcom games for the system. Now while we're in the darker fantasy realm, I did want to list off a handful of games that might not be firmly in the horror camp, but certainly worth mentioning in case you're in the mood for more swords and skeletons. Wardner and Zombie Hunter are a couple of Japanese exclusives. And we have the macabre Castle of Dragon and aggressively similar Swordmaster, the nightmarish trial and error death traps of the Immortal and Dragon's Lair, and the skeleton smashing adventures of Astronax and Conan, the Famicom exclusives Captain Silver and Firebam full of all sorts of weird monstery stuff, and finally Demon Sword with its Japanese version rooted heavily in supernatural folklore, which actually glides us nicely into another subgenre of 8-bit horror the world of yokai. If you're not familiar with yokai, it's basically a catch-all term for various supernatural entities in Japanese folklore, and it was a recurring theme in many Famicom games that never saw a release outside of Japan. Yokai Club is one such a game published by Jalico in 1987, bearing some heavy Castlevania inspiration on its sleeve, but also introducing some experience gaining mechanics and a few non-linear moments and of course all sorts of weird yokai fiends to deal with.
Originally an arcade game, Yokai Dochuki is a platformer where you play as a young mischievous boy banished to the demon infested purgatory like Jigoku, and you must make your way to Yama, the Buddhist deity that judges the dead to determine your final fate. It sounds rather grim, but you actually get a cute and fun side scrolling run and gun here, with multiple endings depending on how high you can build up your pious meter. Originally released on the MSX by Casio, Yokai Yashiki is Irem's take on this haunted house adventure for the Famicom Disk System. Armed with only a flashlight, you explore this ghost-filled mansion in search of your sister, and collecting all the required talismans for facing off with the level's boss. The game got a much-needed graphical overhaul from the original, but you still have a rather simplistic and confusing experience here that might have you busting out some pencil and paper to effectively navigate the maze-like stages. Gegege no Kitaro was originally a classic manga series, with yokai monsters being a central theme for all of its media to follow, including anime, live action movies, and 15 different video games, with this being the first, released in 1986 by Bandai. It also saw a completely reskinned version in the States called Ninja Kid, but with all references to Kitaro removed. It's a platformer at its core, but there are a handful of different gameplay loops that add some variety and give a very fun, arcadey feel on top of its ghostly flavor. The second Gegege no Kitaro game switched gears and gives us a more traditional RPG experience. Luckily, a fan made translation exists, so the game is fully playable in English. Admittedly, I haven't spent much time with this one yet, and it looks a bit generic at first glance but it's likely of interest to anyone with a curiosity in the series. Here we have an adventure game by Taito, based on the Japanese movie Kionchi's 2, a sequel to a movie called Mr. Vampire, an 80s martial arts horror jam featuring hopping vampires from Chinese folklore. This one seems to lack a translation currently, Thanks to this probably haunted self-playing demo, it looks like a hybrid of a graphic adventure game with some side-scrolling action moments as well. Speaking of Mr. Vampire, this game is actually based directly on that film, despite Kionchi's 2 coming out before this did. Phantom Fighter bears some similarities as well, but with much more detailed graphics, along with a release in the US from FCI. This is an odd, clunky game that starts a bit slow, but it gets much more interesting as you level up and gain new techniques while you purge eight different villages of the hopping vampire scourge. Let the fighting continue with Hellfighter, an unlicensed Sachin game from 1991, a surprisingly competent little run and gun bootleg where you face off with Satan himself. You can smash blocks with your head or feet and grab various power up orbs for stronger projectiles or add damaging orbs that revolve around you. It's generally very straightforward but just plain monster slaying fun and definitely one of the best Sachin games that I've tried out. And another unlicensed gem I gotta mention is Robodemons, a hybrid platformer shmup from the brain trust at Color Dreams. Armed with only your trusty boomerang, you must defeat King Cole and his robotic demon army in this oddly charming jankfest. Something about the chaotic and messy art style and depressing soundtrack just makes me happy. This game ends up being more fun than it has any right to be. And here we have a Japanese exclusive demon slaying saga to dig into with Getsu Fumiden. Taking place in 14,672 AD, 
you control Fuma in this 1987 adventure which never made it stateside. Taking a few cues from Simon's Quest and maybe a bit of Zelda 2, this game mashes up action platforming with RPG elements, a top-down overworld map, and even a bit of dungeon crawling. It's a very ambitious and intriguing experience crafted with the polish you would expect from Konami. And of course, we have to take a look at that lenticular box art. Genpei Tomoden originally was a Namco arcade game featuring a demon-slaying samurai ghost, but his appearance on the Famicom was unique, to say the least, in the form of a virtual board game, and it came with actual game pieces and everything. Now I haven't experienced this tangible version myself, and honestly not sure how spooky it gets, or if there's even a translation floating around out there, but it's surely an interesting attempt for an opportunity to further expand the ghostly lore of the original game. Now the oldest game we're covering in this video is Nintendo's Devil World, an arcade-style maze game that was not released in the US at the time, probably due to its religious and satanic imagery. Seems funny now with how cute this game looks, but I guess at the time we missed out on a very solid and fun title here, with the very memorable devil character pointing in various directions to have his minions move the maze around with ropes along the edges of the screen. It's a neat concept and fun to pick up and play in short bursts. The classic horror manga and anime series Devil Man from Go Nagai would also find his way onto the Famicom. It's an action adventure game starting off with you in control of Akira Fudo, talking to various characters and eventually seeing you transform into Devil Man to actually start and battle the demons wreaking havoc in your town. I really dig the Golgo 13 vibes here, and while I haven't played this one too much yet, I'm glad there's an English translation available on this one. Here's another game based on a manga and anime series called Ushio Totora, the story of a kid and his demon buddy and all the hijinks that ensue in their fights with other demons threatening their world. I haven't watched it yet, but it sounds fun enough, and it received a couple of video game incarnations too. The Super Famicom would get an action platformer, but players still rocking the OG Famicom in 1993 would get this stylish looking RPG, which fortunately received a recent fan translation in 2022. And in the humble beginnings of what would kick off a massive game franchise, we have the first-person dungeon-crawling RPG classic, Digital Devil Story, Megami Tensei. You control a party of two high school kids battling the forces of Lucifer, who was unleashed by a computer program. Gameplay here is heavily inspired by wizardry, but also introducing the mechanic of convincing defeated demons to help you out, including the option to fuse collected demons together into more powerful forms something that has continued to be a primary gameplay hook in the series to this day. The Megami Tensei series would continue in 1990, this time dropping you into a post-apocalyptic Tokyo. Gameplay seems fairly similar to the challenging original, but we do get some top-down overworld navigation between levels added in, along with dialogue options that may influence how other characters and demons react to you, and eventually affect the game's ending. After this game was released, Atlas would acquire the rights to make more Megami Tensei titles on their own, eventually remaking and expanding this game into Shin Megami Tensei on the Super Famicom, and the rest is history from there. Okay, we have enough demons now, it's time to let Jesus into our lives, with Jesus Kyofu no Bio Monster. Originally released for a handful of Japanese computer platforms, Enix would eventually bring this graphic adventure game to the Famicom in 1989, with a story drawing heavy inspiration from the Alien film franchise, where you and your crew onboard the space station Jesus 
uncover the mysteries of Halley's Comet, and face off with a terrifying alien. Gameplay isn't far off from something like Shadowgate, but much more simplified, and lacking the numerous creative ways to die. But at least it's worth a look for the really nice anime-style graphics and tense sci-fi horror atmosphere. And while we find ourselves in the sci-fi horror section of our little Venn diagram, we can't not talk about Metroid. While this landmark title perhaps fits more into a sci-fi adventure box, the feelings of deep space isolation while exploring the dark, unknown planet were remarkably represented for a game in 1986, and some moments remain as some of the most creepy and memorable set pieces in gaming history. I know I'll never forget the pure terror of Mother Brain's hallway when I was a kid. While the first Metroid may feel a bit primitive compared to what this franchise continued on with, its legacy and influence are undeniable, and it remains a true sci-fi horror-adventure classic. Now it's tough to follow up Metroid, so we might as well scrape the bottom of the barrel here with this slime-covered port of Xenophobe. Originally a Bally Midway arcade game with a pretty neat three-player split-screen setup, the NES port by Sunsoft scales down to a two-player layout and somehow sucks out all the fun as if it were in an airlock. At its core, it's still an unending arcade game without much of a goal other than rolling the score back to zero, and even doing this is a pretty easy and generally unsatisfying accomplishment. Maybe check out one of the other various ports or go for the arcade original. David Fincher's Alien 3 would be released in theaters in 1992 with uh, mixed reviews, and also setting off a slew of video game adaptations on a wide array of consoles and eventually hitting the NES in 1993. For better or worse, it doesn't pay much mind to the plot of the film, as you control a pulse rifle wielding Ripley, blasting away xenomorphs and rescuing prisoners before aliens burst out of their chests. The graphics and sound make for a really cool and dark atmosphere here, although some of the tenseness feels a bit forced by a painfully tight timer to complete a stage. But if you don't mind a bit of trial and error while you figure out the best routes to complete the levels fast enough, this is definitely a solid sci-fi horror outing. We'd continue to see the influence of the Alien film franchise on the era's video games in Alien Syndrome, originally made for arcades by Sega in 1987 and ported to the NES a year later by Tengen, without an official Nintendo license. It's a top-down run-and-gun that's also dripping with acidic atmosphere on top of straightforward but very fun gameplay, rescuing comrades and blasting aliens with a wide variety of weaponry. It's definitely a blast to play through, especially with two-player co-op. Body horror imagery and shoot 'em ups is always a fun combo, and very well represented here with Abadox, the deadly inner war, all taking place inside of the guts of a giant alien. It's a fairly typical instance of the genre, with punishing difficulty taking away all of your power ups after a death, but it does feature some great graphics and music as you blast your way through the slimy intestinal tracks of parasitis. Now we may be drifting out a little bit far into space and away from the pure horror vibes, so I'd like to list off a handful of other sci-fi horror adjacent action titles here. We probably wouldn't have Abadox without Konami's classic shmup Life Force, for example. And we have a few other great shmups like Burai Fighter, Isolated Warrior, and Special Cybernetic Attack Team Scat. We've also got the Metroid-ish Biosenchidan and Worm Journey to the Center of the Earth, which is very notable for mashing up all sorts of weird genres in one. Kabuki Quantum Fighter is another wild game full of all sorts of weird cybernetic creeps and body horror guts. 
And I've got to mention Contra and Super C as well, which go full-on HR Giger mode once you finally approach their respective alien lairs. We should show some love to old Arnold as well, with a handful of games based on Predator and the Terminator movies. Yes, the Terminator is a slasher movie, and you can't convince me otherwise. Although, I can't fully endorse the video game versions, translating much of that vibe to the NES. Moving on, we'll stretch out our net a little bit further to look into Darkman, a video game adaptation of Sam Raimi's superhero flick from 1990, heavily inspired by Universal Horror Classics. You control said hero in a beat-em-up platformer interspersed with other varieties of gameplay, including this pretty cool mini-game getting photos to create new masks to obscure your disfigured face. This game often gets dunked on for its slippery controls and unforgiving difficulty, but I definitely have a soft spot for this one. You know I'll come to the defense of this guy too, it's Swamp Thing on the NES, released in 1992, based on the DC comic superhero, although more directly referencing the short-lived cartoon series. Odd play control choices brought over from Bart vs. the Space Mutants, and some fairly gritty looking graphics lead many folks to discard this game at first glance. But I embraced the swamp life and truly have a fun time with this one every time I dive into the muck. Another campy classic from the same dev publisher combo that year was Attack of the Killer Tomatoes, also based on a cartoon series that was based on the 1978 low budget B movie spoof. Like Swamp Thing, again we have something pretty rough around the edges, but there's something charming here. There are actually some pretty creative and ambitious ideas beyond a typical run and jump title. And the godfather of killer shark movies would also swim its way onto the NES with Jaws, another LJN jam loosely based on the fourth movie in the series, Jaws the Revenge. I'll admit, this one doesn't feel too scary most of the time, as the majority of the game is spent diving down and shooting various sea critters to collect enough conch shells to upgrade your boat and eventually defeat Jaws himself. It's a rather short game if you know what to do, but generally pretty fun and a somewhat unique approach to bringing the terror of Jaws to the system. And of course, we have to pay tribute to the infamous king of the monsters himself, with Godzilla, monster of monsters. The iconic radioactive reptile stomps his way onto the NES with Mothra along for the ride, in a side-scrolling action game full of smashing stuff and facing off with various foes from other Toho monster movie classics. Now I don't necessarily consider all Japanese kaiju films to be pure horror, but I just couldn't bring myself to leave this guy out. We'd also see plenty of other kaiju appearances on the Famicom and NES, with the more strategy-focused Godzilla 2, Data East's goofy spoof Daikaiju Deboras, which recently got a full translation, Konami's King Kong 2, a handful of Ultraman games, and of course we can't forget the building-smashing arcade classic Rampage. If you've made it this far into the video, congratulations, you're probably deranged enough to appreciate the insanity that is Zombie Nation, an unhinged shoot-'em-up featuring a giant floating samurai head blowing up buildings and monsters alike with his eyeballs and vomit projectiles. A meteorite has crashed into the Nevada desert in 1999 unleashing the alien Dark Seed, who has turned Americans into zombies and even reanimated the Statue of Liberty to inflict further carnage upon the planet. Overall, it's an absolutely crazy and chaotic ride, 
and definitely a fun time once you get the hang of the frantic gameplay. Last and definitely least, one of the most notorious light gun games ever made saw an unlicensed port to the NES with Chiller. Originally released on arcades in 1986 by Exidy, you essentially just maim and mutilate seemingly innocent people in a handful of dungeon settings, along with blasting away other random ghosts and generic monsters. It's an interesting curiosity for its senseless and cheap shock value, but it's barely playable. And that concludes our tour of horror on the NES and Famicom. Now one facet of the library we didn't get into today is the very lively and vibrant scene for independent homebrew game development. There's some really cool horror themed games that have come out on the NES in recent years, and with the passion being poured into these, I think they're worthy of being featured in their own video eventually, so keep an eye out for that in the future. And thank you so much for watching. I know there was a lot of ground to cover, and I commend you for surviving to the end. If you think there was any games I may have missed, please drop a comment as I'd love to learn about it. I'm also curious if you think any of these are worth a deeper dive individually. I learned so much while researching for this video, and I definitely want to give some of these games a more in-depth look. I can't believe Burst didn't include me in his video. I will destroy him. Destroy!